Let's turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Wanting to do our second part to Jesus, the great separator. May look at it from a little bit different angle because we kind of last time that we talked about Jesus, the great separator, we saw the separation. We looked at it in different regards of the rapture and Jesus separating, things of that nature. But tonight I want us to look at it in a little bit different light. We, we're going to hit some familiar scripture uh, that we all should know. Uh, we're going to start at John chapter 10 verse 24 is where we'll start. John chapter 10 verse 24. But I want us to see this not in the eyes of when Jesus separates, one is better than the other. In some regards, yes, that, that is true because you have somebody who has dedicated their life to God, who has separated themselves from their carnality, from their flesh, from sin, and they're pursuing a relationship with God. They're pursuing God Himself, His Word, His presence. So I don't want us to neglect that. But I don't want us to also fall into the religious trap of saying, oh, well, well, we're going to be better because we're going to be separated from all of those that are not going with Jesus. However, no, we need to make sure that why we are being separated and how maybe those that are on the wrong track, maybe today or however you want to look at that in this time right now in this season, that we can help pull them into the proper direction, get them to when the, when the separation is coming, whether it's now in families and situations or whether it's the rapture when Jesus separates, that we can make sure that we're getting everybody that we can on the correct side with Jesus Christ so when the separation happens that we'll be together with Jesus. So I want us to maybe look at it from that point of view tonight. So John chapter 10 verse 24 then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? Or how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So they are point blank telling Jesus, If you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Don't hold it back. Don't beat around the bush. Just tell us straight out that you're the Christ. And Jesus answered them, I told you. I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So he's already telling them, look, I've, I've told you. You're not listening. You're not hearing what I'm saying. I've already told you. And he says, and, the, and the, you believe not the works. He said, you believe not what I've done. Everything that I've done is to prove that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the anointed one from God the Father, you won't believe it. Even though you see it, you won't believe it. There are many people that are in today's time that they'll see the hand of God. They'll see different things, yet they will still refuse to believe the things of God. They'll still refuse to say, well, that, that's really of God. I need to make sure that I'm following God, that I'm denying myself, picking up my cross and following Him. They won't make it. It's, it doesn't, what they see, they'll say, oh, that's God. That's really neat. But it doesn't mean as much to them, so they... In essence, they believe not because they'll still follow something else. Whatever you follow is what you really believe in. Whatever you follow is really what you believe in. So I told you and you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So he said, I do these in my Father's name. I don't do them in my name, I do them in my Father's name. And the works even bear witness of who he is. But verse 26, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. He says, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. Because you're not of my household or not of my flock, we could say. He says, you don't believe. So, in essence, we can say they, they don't believe because they're not in his flock. And they're not in his flock because they don't believe. So now we're at a conundrum. <laughs> which, which should come first? Well, if you believe, then that means that's what you're going to follow. That's what you're going to be part of. So to be part of his sheep, you must believe. 
And then once you're his sheep, you will, you, because you already believe, you're going to continue to follow him, or what you should, until the moment comes that you start believing a lie or you start believing a deception and you quit believing and now you're no longer his sheep even though you're still baying like a sheep. Baying like a sheep, however you want to say it. But verse 26, But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now notice the action there. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. So if you're one of his sheep, you hear his voice, you, you, he knows you, and you follow him. So there is an action. So what, kind of looking at this, I want us to see what is the cause of the great separation? What is the cause of this separation? It is all based on action. Action causes the separation. Or we could say lack of action causes the separation. Because as we even see from this verse, and we're going to see it in other examples that Jesus speaks of as well. But verse 27 again, my sheep hear my voice. So in other words, those that don't, they don't hear his voice. Those that are not his sheep, they don't hear his voice. Why? Because it's probably not what he means as in they don't hear it, as in they can't hear what he's saying they don't give attention to it. They don't pay attention to it. That's like in a, in a room full of people, if I hear my wife's voice, it perks up my ears and I start looking for where she is. Why? Because there's a relationship there. Because I know that's my wife's voice. I know that voice. And there's been times I've been, you know, maybe at work or if I was covering a county for somebody where I'm doing background checks, things of that nature, and all of a sudden I hear what sounds like my wife's voice, I'll start looking around. Because for a split second, I'll forget where I'm at, and I think I hear her voice, so I start looking around, and I get excited. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I'm at a courthouse like an hour and a half away from my house, and there's no reason for her to be here. Why am I even... But because my ear is trained to hear my wife's voice because of that relationship and because of that excitement of my heart, then I will hear her voice and I will go to her, or if she's coming to me, however you want to look at that. But for us, as sheep of the true, true shepherd, Jesus Christ, when we hear his voice, we're not just to hear it and hear it like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. That's the way some people hear Jesus. That's the way some people hear many good preachers or pastors. No wonder their lives are going nowhere. Because that's what you hear. But if you have that relationship with Jesus, if you're truly seeking after Him, you'll hear His voice. But also He knows you. And it says, and they follow me. That's an action. Action make a sheep. Action make a sheep. And they follow me. Then He says, and I give unto them eternal life. Notice the eternal life is only a product of your action. Eternal life is only a product of your, of your action. Now, that doesn't mean we work our way into heaven. We can work our way to earn salvation. No, no, no. It just means we're following Jesus. It means we're a disciple of His. It means we're one of His sheep. That means that we know Him and He knows us. That's how we get our eternal salvation. Is Yes, we can be forgiven of our sins. That's awesome. That means we're born again. But the word also tells us, and we may see it tonight, but it says that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That means if you don't endure, even though you've been born again, you won't receive your salvation. You won't see the fruit of it. You won't see the fruition of it come to pass. And in these last days, too many people are giving up their salvation. They're giving up the things of God in their life, but yet they still think, well, because I believe and because I think he's there, then I'm good with God. That's going to be part of the sadness of the great separator of Jesus Christ when he comes and separates the people is that's going to be the sad reality to some people is when they see Jesus in the air and they realize they're not going with him. That's a separation. But it's all based on what we do now. If, if we're choosing to follow him, if we're choosing to give ear to Jesus Christ, if we're choosing to be part of his flock, be part of his sheep, then that's what will help us to be on the correct side 
of Jesus when he brings this separation, not only for time now, but for time to come. I don't know if you realize or not, but in these last days, there is a great separation already taking place. We could also call it, uh, the, the, the word also calls it the great falling away. That's a separation of people that you never would have thought would have left the house of God, would have left a, a relationship with God, who would have walked away from God. They're walking away. Why? Because they don't endure. They don't follow. They don't give ear to Jesus. They don't hear him and they quit following him so Jesus doesn't know them. It's like he loses a little bit at a time of knowing them because they slowly and sure that they just slowly, slowly, slowly back away from him and they walk away from Jesus Christ. And that is so sad because it's our own fault if we follow Jesus or not. It's our own fault determination of where we land when it comes to the separation. Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Notice it says, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Notice it's man. Now, man is italicized there, so we know that that's part, maybe not part of the original context, not part of the original language, but it's put in there to, for the understanding to help, us, to help us know that neither shall any man or any snatch them or pluck them out of my hand. Nobody else can come along and snatch you out of God's hand. So that leaves even this separation on our own fault, on our own conscious on our own choosing because nobody else can pull you out of God's hand <laughs> there's a famous well famous saying but famous finger pointing well the devil made me do it no he didn't you chose to uh, to listen to that voice you chose to honor what you were being deceived what you were being enticed with you chose it yourself Many times I say, well, why'd you do this? I don't know. Yeah, you do. You know exactly why you chose to do that. Don't lie. You know why you did it. Why there be laziness? Why there be carnality? Why there be just because you, I don't know, didn't put up a fight to endure, to have your salvation? Because you got to remember, our endurance to our salvation doesn't only mean us making it to heaven. Our salvation comes in many forms through Jesus Christ because he came to give us life and life more abundantly. So when you choose to neglect him, when you choose to separate yourself from him, whatever salvation that he had in store for you, whether it be healing, whether it be finances, whether it be seeing other things in your life come to fruition, you, you take that chance and you are cutting yourself off from that salvation when you don't endure and press through. If we give up too quickly, then what are we missing out on? What are we giving up on when we don't press through? Because we allow a little separation in our heart and our mind to separate us from Jesus Christ, all because we don't want to do what He's commanded us to do. That's what it boils down to. When we refuse to do what Jesus wants us to do, we separate ourselves. So as much as we can say Jesus the great separator, it's like, yes, he is the separating factor because you're either going to choose his side or you're going to choose the opposite. So really, it's him in the middle. You're either going to be on his side or you're going to be on the devil's side. But it's our own choosing. So by true definition, the separation comes on us. So, but what are we going to choose? We're going to choose Jesus. We're going to choose the devil. Because there's no other ground. There's no other side. It says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them or snatch them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So now he says, he takes it a step further. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. So God is greater than all. So he's glorifying God. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So notice, he not only 
puts himself in there. No man can p- pluck you or snatch you out of my hand. He says, no man can pluck you out of, or snatch you out of God's hand. So we're in good hands. We're better than all state. We're in good hands with Jesus Christ and God the Father. But too many times, nobody comes to snatch us out. We jump out. We jump out of God's hands. We jump out of the hands of Jesus and do our own thing. Because now we're not putting our faith and trust in Jesus. We're not following Him. We want to follow ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. Get ourselves in trouble is what we do. But notice verse 30. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. So we can see here that those that follow Jesus are of His sheep. And the separation comes, rather, you're His sheep and you'll follow Him, or you become something else and you don't follow Him, which I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because we're going to cover that in a few minutes. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. We looked at this, I believe, briefly Sunday night in a different context. Luke chapter 3. Let's start at verse 15. Luke chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, Whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. We would say thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner. We say, gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So already we can see a separation here with what John is referencing Jesus. He's going to bring his fan in his hand. That means his winnowing fork, his winnowing fan, which is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, the wheat is what you use to make bread, which you use, can use to make things out of. The chaff is really no good. The chaff is just, it's thrown up in the air. When you, see the, when you see this fan, when you see it in action, take this fan and you throw wheat up and it has the chaff in with it and the chaff will blow away with the wind and the wheat will fall right back down because it's got more weight to it. So we can see even in this verse, the ones that even John is alluding to of, of Jesus when he brings this separation, when Jesus brings the separation of the fan in his hand, there's going to be a separation. The one, they both go up in the air and the separation comes with one is blown away and then the other one comes back down to where they're supposed to be. Now here's where we also kind of bring this back to also John chapter 10. When he talks about sheep, sheep are good and they produce things. Now, as we're going to see from another verse, goats are not much good for anything. <laughs> They're good for a few things, but not too much. But we can see from this, when you have wheat, when you throw this, when you throw these up and they're separated, the chaff just blows into the wind, it's gathered and burned. The wheat falls back down and the wheat can produce something. The wheat produces bread. Wheat produces life and things that can sustain life. So if we're not we're not careful if if we separate ourselves from Jesus Christ and we don't allow ourselves to be used by God if we don't make ourselves humble in his eyes and allow him to use us then we become just as the chaff because we're not good for anything what God tells us what he wants us to do we just blow away with sound with unsound doctrine we blow away with doctrines of devils why because we've quit putting the effort into being who God wants us to be and we become what we want to be and God can't use us we become proud, we become haughty, we become arrogant. And so when he comes to when Jesus comes to use his fan, he pitches us up, and if we're haughty and high minded, we'll blow away with the chaff because he can't use us. So Jesus, the great separator, separates those he can't use with those he can. So it's important for us to be like the wheat that we say, God, whatever you want in my life, make me whatever you want me to be. Make me into something 
that you want, that you can be glorified with. Make me into something that you desire for me to be because you have plans and purposes for my life, so make me into what you want me to be. Verse 17 again. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. So, so John, even preaching of Jesus, even witnessing of Jesus, gives many other things that he preaches unto the people. That He tells them there's a separation coming. There's a man who's coming, and he's going to be this great separator, and he's going to separate those that will just blow away and those that will really want to stay with him. But all of that deter- is determined by what we want to be, what we declare we're going to be. So may we... Allow God to be the God of our life, not just, we say, all right, God, use me, make me a showboat, make me whatever that makes me, that gains me fame and fortune and notoriety. No, no, no. We should say, God, whatever you want me to be. Make me what you want me to be. Use me. Make me worthy. Make me worthy of being, uh, being used for your kingdom. Because remember, even in the New Testament, it talks about there are some vessels of honor and there's some for dishonor. There are some that you can use in a great house, or even in a great house, there are some vessels that are used for honor, some that are used for dishonor. May we, have, may we be the vessels that are used for honor, that God can see and receive the glory and honor from our lives and how we conduct ourselves, all because we choose to follow Him and not be separated from Him. It says, and many other things, it said, many other exhortations He preached. He preached unto the people. So let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Let's start at verse 32. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 says, Whosoever, therefore, this is Jesus speaking, shall confess me before men, and we've talked about that, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So notice there's already a commitment being made here that Jesus is speaking of. Therefore, whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men. That is using, being used by God to be a testimony of your covenant with him. Being used by God to to show that covenant. Show that you're acknowledging Jesus in your life. Therefore, who shall ever confess me before men? Acknowledge Jesus. Acknowledge who He is, not only in your life, but who He is as the Son of God. Who He is as the Messiah, the Anointed One. So we've got to make sure that when we have our lives, that we're following Jesus Christ. That we're making note of who He is with everything that we do. And that's sadly going to bring some separation because there's going to be some people who will want to be around you because you stand for Christ, because you confess who He is, because you show you have a covenant with Him. And there's going to be those who are not going to want to be around you because you make that confession, because you have that covenant. (laughs) It's sad that even among Christians, there is still that separation. There is still that separation. Even people that declare to love Christ, to love God the Father, they still have that separation among the people. Why? Because there's always going to be lukewarm Christians. There's always going to be somebody who knows they should do better, but they don't want to put the effort into it. And that is, that is maybe part of this great separator that we are probably more familiar with. Is when you're on fire for God, then you can tell real quick who does not want to be around you. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, when you're kind of teeter tottering on being enticed, wanting to maybe do a few things that you know doesn't line up, you don't want to be around, or we should, I should say we, we don't want to be around people that are on fire for God either. Why? Because we know better. And it brings that separation within our own mind of saying, I need to get this lined up with God. I know it. 
But just as, just as soon as we make things right with God and we get on fire for him again, then there's going to be somebody else who's we've almost flip-flopped situations. But the goal for our Christianity is not to weeble wobble and all of this stuff throughout our lives. It's to stay on fire for God because we never know when Jesus is going to come back in the air to gather up God's people, and then it's going to be the great it's going to be the great separation because of the rapture. That's not a, for lack of a better word, that's not a chance we can take. We don't believe in chance. We don't believe in luck. But you catch the heart of it. That's not something that we need to have on the line of all of our eternity. Because if we can barely make it in these days, in these last days, some people are not going to make it through the tribulation. If you can barely make it to church now, you're not going to make it through the tribulation. If you can barely read your Bible now, you're not going to make it through the tribulation. If you can barely pray now, you're not going to make it through the tribulation. But yet so many people want to play this game of one foot with God, one foot with the world. One foot with God, one foot with the world. And you're going to have to choose because Jesus, the great separator, is going to come along at some point in your life. And he's going to cause that separation to be so great that you're going to have to choose one side or the other. It's like maybe an old old Western where guy's riding on two horses. Maybe he's trying to save somebody or do something and the horses begin to separate. There's going to come a time he's going to have to choose one of those horses. And whichever horse you choose is, is life or death in this situation when it comes to your walk with God. So may we choose life. That sounds like another passage of Scripture. <laughs> but Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. He will confess. Why? Because we've confessed. Even going back to the sheep, they know, they know his voice, so he knows them. This brings it almost full circle for us. If we confess him, he confesses us. If we hear his voice, he knows us. He declares who we are in him. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You deny him, he's going to deny you. That's a separation. That's a separation. But notice in both of these verses... Who chooses first? The person. Whosoever chooses first. Jesus doesn't do the choosing first. The person does the choosing. That's like even the verse, many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because they first chose Jesus. Your chosen stance, where you choose to stand, is your choice. (laughs) I mean, where, where you will be for all eternity is every one of our own choices. That's why we walk out our own salvation in fear and trembling. We've got to choose, I'm serving God. That's the reason I like Joshua. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Doesn't matter if anybody else goes or not, we're going to serve the Lord. They got my mind made up, my heart is fixed. I like that song. To follow Jesus all the way. I ain't quitting, I ain't making to the fourth quarter and giving up. I ain't making to the last minute and just throwing my hands up and quitting. No, 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 no. If you haven't noticed, I don't have quit in me. You shouldn't have quit in you. The only thing we should want to quit is sin. The only thing we should want to quit is being spiritually retarded. We should have this winning attitude about us, not just a winning attitude of winning personality. No, no, we win because we're going after Jesus and because we're going to be, we're determined to be on his side because that's the winning side, but we're determined to be on that side because we love Jesus and because we know him and he knows us. So we won't let anything or anybody or anything else, even our own mind and our own heart, our own emotions get in our way to separate us from Jesus Christ. But verse 33 again, but whosoever shall deny me before men, Him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So our choice, we get to choose first. We have to choose Christ or we choose not to partake with Him. Verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. There's the separation. There's the separation. Think not that I come to send peace. Jesus doesn't come to send peace. Jesus comes to be a sword which even takes us to Ephesians 6, 
The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, what is Jesus? The Word made flesh. So no matter how you go about it, the Word of God is a, is a sword. And it's going to separate. It's going to cut off different things. Not only should it cut off hindrances, not only should it cut off weights and sins that does so easily beset us, but it should also cut off those that refuse to repent because we're so on fire for God that they've come with a choice that they all have to repent and make things right to remain in our life, or they're going to have to just cut our friendship off because they are tired of being convicted. But too many times that doesn't happen because we go from burning hot on fire for God to lukewarm and now they're comfortable being around us. And that's not proper. That's not the way that Jesus set things out to be. Too many Christians want to have be peacekeepers and not peacemakers. Because they don't want to be the sore. They don't want to be the thing that cuts things off. They don't want to be... They want to use the Word of God. They don't want to have a true walk with Jesus Christ because, I don't know if you know it or not, but many people that walked with Jesus, they would leave Him. They would forsake Him. Why? Because He would offend them. Because He was so true to being the Son of God, so true to being the Messiah, so true to being clean and holy, even when He would speak, people would get offended and they would leave Him. So much so that Jesus turned around and looked at His own disciples. Are you going to leave me now? You going to leave me too? Where else will we go, Lord? <laughs> like what Pastor Ronnie Pittman said, till you're stuck with Jesus, then it's like you won't go, you won't go anywhere. You got nowhere else to go until you're stuck with Jesus. Until you're until you're with him, until you're stuck with him, then you have the choice to go somewhere else. But if once you make up your mind of saying I'm stuck with Jesus, I'm stuck on him, wherever he goes, I'm going. I'm going to be stuck like glue. <laughs> we stuck to him because no matter where he goes, I'm going to. Because until you realize that you've got to be stuck to him, something else will try to separate you. Even when you are in your heart and your mind stuck to him, there's still going to be other things that are trying to weasel its way into your mind and to your heart to get you to separate. Now, sometimes the enemy will use a person but really, ultimately, it's, as we said earlier, it's our choice. They can, give you, they can give influence into your life, influence into your ear, influence into your mind, influence into your heart, but it's ultimately going to be our choice. That's like with adulteries, fornications, drugs, alcohol, any of those things of that nature. Usually, a person doesn't start out especially in a marriage, they don't start out in their mind of saying, you know what, I feel like having an affair today. No, 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 that's not how that starts. It's usually little by little, influence a little bit at a time, influence a little bit at a time until the influence is away from the spouse and on to whoever they're about to commit adultery with. So it's not really necessarily the person, the other person that is, that the that this person will say, Person A, we'll say the man. We'll just clear, clarify it that way. If the man is going to have sex with a woman that's not his wife, it's not that woman is to blame. She is playing part of this role, but she's not the sole purpose that he is in this adulterous affair. It's technically both of them. It's the man and the woman having the affair. Because they both gave, allowed that influence to be in their heart and their mind to separate this man from his wife. But if he would have spoken and said, no, 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 I'm not giving influence to this. I'm not giving influence to this. No matter how hard she tried to come on, no matter how hard she tried to get into his mind, to get into his heart, get into his pants, however you want to look at it, then if he would have been determined to say, nope, I'm not doing this. Nope, I'm not doing this. <laughs> now for some people they say well yeah you're right that man should act like that he shouldn't allow that woman near him well how come we do the same thing with God we allow the things of the enemy the things of the world to flirt with us we entertain it we don't shut it off like we should we entertain it give it attention and then the next thing you know it's a little bit more a little bit more attention and a little bit more attention. And the next thing you know, you're not walking with God any longer. You're giving full-blown attention to whatever it is that's been distracting you and trying to gain your attention. Now it's gained it. It will leave you high and dry once it's done with you. 
Much like most, not all, most affairs that happen, uh, that happen like that, most affairs that happen of that nature, the couple that gets together during the affair, they usually don't wind up together. <laughs> Why? Well, for one, anybody with any common sense says if you're willing to leave your spouse, then you would you would be willing to leave me for somebody else. But see, sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid of, oh, we, but we're in love, but we're in love. But really, when you finally accomplish that, then it's all the pleasure is gone. Why? Because all of the the, the risk, all of the danger, all of the adrenaline is gone because now you've got nothing left to lose. And that's the way sin is. It has a pleasure for a season, and then once it really entraps you, and all the, the flair has gone out of it, all the excitement has gone out of it, now you're having to reap the consequences of what you've sown into. Whether it's you know sex before marriage, maybe you're reaping an STD, maybe you're reaping an unwanted pregnancy. If it's drugs, maybe you, you went from smoking a little marijuana to getting something to now you're addicted and you can't live without whatever, you're, whatever it is is for your next hit. But all of the, all of the flair, all the fun's been taken out. Now, you, now you've got a, that's like you're, uh, you're an addict to where you can't live without it. You feel like your, your body's going to explode. You feel like all these things are going to implode in your body if you don't get that next hit. Now it's no fun. Now it's just a matter of survival. But that's what happens when you allow even small things to gain influence and favor into your heart and your mind and separate you from Jesus Christ. We've got to stay connected with Jesus. That's the reason we've got to choose to be married to Jesus. To say, I'm staying with Him. I've got a covenant. I'm not breaking my covenant no matter what. But sometimes that doesn't look so peaceful. Sometimes that doesn't look like the best peace on earth. <laughs> now remember when Jesus was, when, when it was prophesied Jesus being born, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And many people say, oh, well, he's the, he's the prince of peace. He's come to bring everybody peace. No, 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 that's not what that means. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Goodwill, or it means good tidings, good things for those that follow God doesn't mean to all mankind, only those that follow God. Why? Because they're the ones that have not separated themselves from God, and they're the ones that's going to reap the benefits of having that relationship. So for here, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. He's the separator. He's the one that's going to be the, the drawing the line in the sand. He's going to be the one that is bringing the separation of either you're going to choose him or you're going to choose the devil. And having a real relationship with Jesus Christ will bring that into your life. I've had to cut my own, some of my own family members off when it came to Jesus Christ and serving Him. Well, how could you do that? How could you, how could you choose to do that to your family? I didn't choose to do that in my family. They chose to do that to me because they made me have to choose between Jesus Christ or them. Now, really... As any Christian should say, that's a no-brainer. That should be Jesus Christ. I want to choose Him every time. But see, when you let that influence, you let that voice in your mind and in your heart, you entertain it and you don't shut it down, you don't cut it off, it begins, it begins to get, gain influence into your life and all of a sudden, oh, but that's family. But that's family. I can't do that to family. I've known them all my life. They've known me all my life. We just... Blood's, blood's so thick, how can I betray my own blood? How can I betray my own kin? Easily. Easily. When it comes to your salvation, when it comes to where you spend eternity, it should be easy. So don't be spiritually retarded and we can fellowship. Because I'm going to choose Jesus every time. <laughs> so you line up with Jesus, don't separate yourself from Him, and we'll be together. But many people don't catch the heart of that. We've got to make sure that we don't separate from Jesus Christ for any reason. And again, it's our decision. Verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance. Now the word variance there means to make apart, to set apart, to separate, to, to divide. 
He says, I'm come to to set a man at variance against his father. Oh, that sheds a whole new light on this situation. Jesus said, a man against his father. So that means that you're either going to choose Jesus or you're going to choose the father. Now, praise God, this is not every family. This is not every situation. Hopefully, there are more families than than maybe we can think of at the moment that the father and the son or the father, it says man and father, but as we're about to see, other family members are involved. Hopefully, they can all serve God together. They can all be united under Jesus Christ because they all choose Him. But when it comes down to it, if... There's going to be a separation, and it's because of Jesus Christ. We better make sure we're on the right side of Christ. Because we cannot afford to be otherwise. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And no, that's not the reason that most in-laws have odds against each other. is because of Jesus. (laughs) There's a whole other message for all of that. There's a whole bit of psychology for all that. Anyway, verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now we read this, we think, man. He that loveth the father and mother more than Jesus is not worthy of him. How is that to be? Well, I mean, it's there in red and white. I can't say black and white because mine's in red, which Jesus is speaking. But if we can see this, if if we love anybody more than Jesus Christ, we've already already separated ourselves from him. We cannot love anybody more than Jesus Christ. It should be God, which includes Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, And then family, then work and other things. That's the order it should be in. God first, because even as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He was including his house because he had authority over it. As for me and my house, (laughs) you, you better believe I've already told my boys, you grow up, you get 18 or older, and you turn your back on God, I'm cutting you off. Now, our littlest one, seven, he doesn't understand that yet, so I haven't really declared that in front of him. But the other two understand. I'm cutting you off. I love you, but I'll cut you off. You turn your back on God and you run away from God, I can't help you. I'm not aiding and abetting a prodigal. I'm not separating myself from Jesus Christ to help you. you. You'll know where we'll be. We'll be in the house of God. We'll be serving God. And as long as you don't separate yourself from him, we can be together. And I'll take care of you as your father. I'll take care of you as your parent. But you turn your back on God, it's sayonara. (laughs) Hmm. But he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So here we can see probably the best two examples of children loving their father and mother more than Jesus. That's not good. That's not balanced. Because if you... Put father and mother, many people will choose father and mother over Jesus. Why? How is that, Pastor? Well, many of them will go and they'll go to church just to just to suit father and mother. Not to really have a relationship with God, just to please mom and daddy. And that's not good. That is not the way that this is intended to be. We should serve the same God. We should serve him together as parents and children. So we don't just do things that lines up with the Bible just for father and mother. We do it because we're in love with God, because it's biblical, and we want to honor our relationship with God first and foremost. If you do that, any good Christian parents, you'll earn, you'll earn their honor and respect because you have your own walk with Him. And your love will grow for them, your, your love will grow for your parents because they will have more honor for you because of your own walk. And it's just going to keep that love and honor and respect growing between you. But then it comes to, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So anybody that chooses the son or daughter more than Jesus Christ is not worthy of him. 
They get themselves in trouble. They're willing to say, well, you know, I know that my son or daughter, I know they're a prodigal. I know they're running from God, but I'm going to try to give them some money. I want to make sure they get fed. I want to make sure that they have this. I want to make sure they have that. I want to make sure, well, what you're doing is you're being their God. And, in, and really, in a sense, is you're separating yourself from even the teaching of Jesus Christ to go be their Savior, to go be their Messiah, to go be the anointed one in their life, to give them to be their supply. We can't do that. We've got to stay with Jesus Christ and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to be faithful and praying for them, and I pray that they repent, I pray that they make it right, and when they repent and make it right with Jesus Christ, then I can bless them, then I can help them, then I can be everything that they need me to be in their life. But until they make it right with God, then I can't be a part of their life in that regard. The only thing I can do is pray for them. So we can't allow family to separate us no matter who it is. <laughs> no, no matter if you're from a state more southern than we are and you're married to your cousin and you can't separate yourself because of Jesus Christ because of those things. Anyway, that's a joke. <laughs> People want to make fun of us from being from Tennessee and having hills and hollers. But anyway, no matter who it is because... Especially in the South, people say blood's thicker than water. You know, you don't, you don't, uh, family's everything. <laughs> There's a few movies that say this, that stuff. Family is everything when you serve God together. But family is nothing when it comes to half of you want to serve God and half of you don't. Because I'm reminded of what this wise man once said. Who is my mother and brethren? except for those who do with the will of my Father. It's Jesus Christ, by the way, just in case you're wondering. He says, who is my mother and brethren, but those who do the will of my Father? And I can honestly say that, that sometimes church family feels more like family than family family. Why? Because you, you live and breathe the ministry. You live and breathe the things of God together. You grow, you grow together in the setting of God, in the house of God, which was what we were designed to do. We're iron sharpening iron. We're helping each other. We're there to one another. We pray for one another. We love on one another. We laugh together. We cry together. You know, it's like even in our church, you know, last year we lost a couple of church members. And, it, was, and it, it hurt our church at their passing that we lost them but we were also able to rejoice as a church together because we knew where both of them went. So it, it's one of those to where we could be there for one another. We could love on one another and help each other, encourage each other during that time. That when we have that camaraderie, when you have that love and, and relationship with one another, then it helps you stay closer together. It helps you to build that, that bond with not only each other, but with God, because you realize you're not alone. It's when you start getting isolated that you feel alone, that you feel like, oh, everybody, nobody else is serving God but me. Well, then that makes you feel like Elijah. And Elijah was wrong. As, as, as many great things, mighty things as, as Elijah did in the Old Testament, in the book of Kings, he done many mighty things. God used him greatly. But it was when he began to isolate himself, when he began to start feeling this, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that's really serving God. I'm the only one that's hearing the voice of God. That he began to go out into the wilderness. He began to chase after other things. And God says, I'm not, I'm not there. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. That's not me moving. He went back to the mountain and looked in the, looked in the tornado, looked in all of these other things. But then it was a still small voice of God. God wasn't in those moves that he used to do. God, with a still, small voice, said, why are you here? In other words, he's saying, why are you coming back to where I used to be, where I used to move? I need you to stay current with me. Because remember, right before that happened, God picked Elijah up, so to speak, or made him outrun the horse and chariot to the gates of Jezreel, right to Jezebel's front door, pretty much. Because that's where God wanted him to be at that moment in time, to take down the enemy. But then even Elijah separated himself from what God wanted him to do. And he goes chasing after something else that he believes, I'll find God out here. I'll find God out here. And he doesn't. 
What he finds is a still small voice that says, why are you here? They found him, but it wasn't a good thing. So we can't separate ourselves from God's presence. We can't separate ourselves from Jesus Christ. Because now praise God for Elijah and, the, and being a prophet in his time. But now we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. So we have more empowerment, we have more authority, more things, more resources within us and upon us than we could say even he did. So why are we choosing to separate ourselves from the things that God has blessed us with? Why are we separating over just not wanting to do what Jesus wants us to do? He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's still an action. As we said earlier, when, when we're something, when we're able to be used of God, when we produce things for the kingdom of God, that's when we know we're on track with God. When we quit producing things for God, when we quit being useful to God in that sense because we're arrogant, because we're prideful, because we're not obeying Him, and everything is dried up where we're no longer useful, we're no longer being used, that's a dangerous situation. Because that shows that we've separated from Jesus. We've separated from what God wants us to do. So verse 38. And he that taketh not his, up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He's not deserving. He's not comparable. He's not suitable for me. Of me, I should say. Verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. In other words, you're trying to do life your own way. You're going to lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So when you lay down your life and say, Jesus, what would you have me do? Because when you lay down your life, that is you separating, separating you from yourself and from what you, the plans, the dreams that you have, and you're stepping out in faith toward Jesus Christ and saying, I no longer want to be by myself. I want to be with you. But even going back to the beginning of this verse, verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. Why? Because when you find your own life, when you find your plan, your purpose, your will, what you want done, then you're going to lose everything because in the presence of God, as Paul says, it amounts to dumb. It amounts to nothing. So why are we trying to make our own life? Why don't we just say, you know what, God, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to follow after you. So that way I'm losing what my mind and my ambition, my dreams are. And I'm going to pick up what you have for me. That I may walk with you. I may serve you. I may follow you all the days of my life. And he that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So we can see here, however you receive, Jesus Christ is the reward that you're going to get in that relationship. If you receive Jesus only as Savior, you'll have a Savior, but you won't have a Lord and Master. If you receive him as Lord and Master, that's what you're going to have. Now, sadly, there, there is a major difference between having a Savior and having a Lord and Master. Many Christians in these last days have a Savior. They've been forgiven of their sins. They've laid all of that down at his feet. But what they really need is a Lord and Master. Somebody commanding their life. Somebody putting out the commands and the Word of God into their life for them to follow. Giving directives. Giving orders that they can follow. That they can know Him and be with Him. Be under His command. That's the reason I like to call you know, Jesus as the commanding officer. That's our spiritual warfare lessons. Because the Holy Spirit's more your NCO. He's the one that's with you in and out because He's in you. And through baptizing the Holy Spirit, He's upon you. So He's with you in the muck and the mire and everywhere that you go. But Jesus is the commanding officer. He's the one that gives the commands. He's the one that puts down the orders for us to follow. Which again, I know we've said it probably a couple of times or not. But He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you honor me, if you love me, then you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do. So in other words, if you have a Savior, you may still not even love Jesus Christ. 
That's something to think about. So even having a Savior could still separate you from Jesus Christ. Because you can be forgiven. That's awesome. That's the beginning of your salvation. But when you don't endure in that relationship, how much are you missing out on and what's your relationship with him going to look like by the time that you reach either the rapture comes or either you reach the end of your life? Because you've quit honoring him, you've quit loving him by keeping his commandments. And that's one of those situations to where even I as a man, I don't want to judge that situation. One, it's not mine to judge. But two, it's like, I'm glad that Jesus, I'm glad that God's got that worked out because I don't want to have anybody's eternity in my hands in that regard. We'll all already have enough in our hands when it comes to the day of judgment of what we did right, what we did wrong, what we should have done, what we could have done, how we flubbed this up, how we got this right. So praise God, it's like, at least we'll have, hopefully we'll have some good things going for us, and we'll also have a few things we know we could have done better. But we already have enough on our plate with that, much less if we were to have to judge somebody else as well. And this is one of those things to where especially the five-fold ministers, especially the pastor, where they're going to have to give an account for everybody that was under them. Why? How did you deal with their soul? How did you help them? Even in that regard, people that choose to separate themselves from Jesus Christ, they're going to have to, in that day of judgment, they're going to have to hear that pastor, that minister, those that were helping in their life. They're going to hear that testimony of that pastor. Here's what I gave them to do. Here's how they handled it. Here's what they chose not to do. Here's where they began to separate. Here's where they began to really be on fire for God. However the situation is, that's the testimony that's going to be given. So I pray, I pray and I pray that we all have a wonderful testimony as we stand before Jesus Christ. As we stand before God, that we'll have good things spoken over us to say, Yep, God, you know I didn't get it perfect. I gave it all I had. I flubbed this up, flubbed that up. But God, I was really, I was really trying to make it right. And the only way to do that is by not separating yourself from Jesus. Not separating yourself. Not allowing things to influence you and deceive you to pull you away. So this verse again, verse 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So we need to make sure we're receiving Jesus in the proper office in our lives, not only as our Savior, but as our Lord and our Master. Amen. Last verse, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we'll start at verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. Jesus speaking. When the, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another. So you can already see He's going to separate nations. As a, sheep divideth, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So let's read that again, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a ship shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, as we mentioned earlier, you have the wheat, the chaff. That's a separation. We already talk, talked about sheep that hear, and maybe we could infer sheep that don't. But now here we can see the sheep, we would say goats that don't, sheep and goats. Now here's the really neat thing about this. You can use wheat, you can use a sheep. A sheep is good to get wool off of. They produce things even though that they may not be the best, smartest animal. <laughs> you can get wool off of them, put that into good use. 
They're still producing something. Even though they're not the smartest, even though they're not the biggest, even though they're not the most predatory animal, they can still produce something in their life that's beneficial. That should help us understand. We're not called to be the biggest and best. We shouldn't, in our minds, say, well, I don't have this going. I guess I'm nothing to Jesus. No, no, no. You can be the dumbest sheep there ever was, and God can still shear you for some good wool and help the kingdom of God. So don't fall for the lie of, well, I'm just no good. I guess I might as well just quit. No, no, no. That's the enemy trying to separate you, trying to get in your mind and separate you from Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he wants to do. But with this analogy, we can see that Jesus calls these people his sheep because they're beneficial, because he loves them, because he's looking over their souls. He's wanting them to be blessed. He's wanting them to be with him. But he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. The goats are not really good. You can't shear them. All they're good for is being rebellious and eating anything in sight. We could preach a whole message on that. How you just want to headbutt everything. No, I don't agree with that, Pastor. Don't agree with that, Pastor. Don't agree with that, Pastor. Don't agree with that. And then you start eating everything. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you, little goat. Hang on. Before you start eating that barbed wire, it's going to cut you up on the inside. It's not going to go well for you. I don't care, Pastor. I'm going to eat it anyway. I don't care if I throw up. I don't care if I poop razor blades. I'm going to poop this out. And I'm going to eat it. I'm going to enjoy every bit of it because you can't tell me what to eat. Well, I can't say that I didn't try. This is the reason that God, that Jesus Christ is going to separate goats from sheep. Because sheep, even though they may not be the smartest animal, they may not be the biggest, they're going to follow they're going to produce things to honor the shepherd. They're still going to follow him because they know his voice. Goats are going to be rebellious. They're going to do their own thing. And they're going to be separated. This is also just a little bit my opinion here. Where we see this, where it says the sheep's on the right hand, the goats are on the left hand. This is interjection just, just to kind of give you food for thought. Because God is a God of symbols. God is... He likes to paint these pictures for us all throughout the Bible. Doesn't necessarily say it, but I believe, and again, if you disagree, whatever it does or in the matter, people are not dying and going to hell over if we disagree with this or not. I believe the person on the right hand of Jesus was the one that repented for his sins, and the one on the left hand is the one that mocked him. Now again... No big deal. But God is a God of God is a God, God of symbolism. He's a God of making, keeping things in order. And so for this to specifically say for Jesus, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, which means they enter into the kingdom of God, if you read this from other scriptures as well. But the goats on the left, which means they are separated from him. But here is the key thing. We can choose if we're a sheep or we can choose if we're a goat. God doesn't determine that for us. Notice, even in this passage, he doesn't say he calls this one a sheep, he calls this one a goat. It just says he separates them. That's all Jesus does is just brings the separation. If you go over here because you're a sheep, you go over here because you're a goat. That's all Jesus has done. That's what it says he's going to do. So for us, we've got to be determined in our heart that we're going to be a sheep. We're going to stay at the right hand of the Father. We're going to stay at the right hand of Jesus Christ, following him everywhere that he says to go. Verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father. That's where you want to be. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, some people would say, well, see, he's already ordained them to be sheep. That means they can have no say about it. No, no, no. All he says is, that I've been establishing the kingdom of God since the foundation of the world. I've been preparing a place for you. And Jesus even tells us, I go to prepare, my, I go to prepare a place for you. I will, come, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. So he, tell, he tells them, there's a place that is being prepared for you, but it's been prepared since the foundation of the world. God has had a heavenly throne to take us to, to be with him, so that we don't have to be separated. <laughs> so as much as we want to say Jesus is the great separator, it's really 
Are you choosing to separate yourself from Jesus Christ? And Jesus being holy and clean, we're going to have to make a choice. Are we going to line up with Jesus to be holy and clean, to be holy like God is holy? Or are we going to choose to be dirty and filthy and be separated from Jesus by our own choice? So coming back to this, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Prepared for you. Notice he doesn't even say prepared for me, prepared for my angels. He says prepared for you. From the foundation of the world. Let's go down to verse 41. You can go back and read some of these others. Now let's go back. Verse 35. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. And then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? And when, he, and when, when shall we, thee, a stranger... We, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and cl- or clothed thee? When ye saw, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? In verse forty, and the king answered, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Notice it's all about the doing. It's all about the doing. Now, again, we're not of those who believe you work your way in for salvation, you work your way into heaven. No, no, no. You got to be born again. It's all about applying God's grace, being forgiven of our sins. But yet, you also got to apply the scripture. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So he says, in as much as ye have done it unto, unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So sheep, are doer of the words by lifestyle. Sheep are doers of the word. Why? Just because they're following Jesus. Because didn't Jesus feed the hungry? Didn't he give water to the thirsty? Didn't he take strangers in? Didn't he clothe somebody that was naked? Well, I don't remember that. Remember the Gadarene demoniac? That by the time he casts out the legion of demons... When the people of the town come back to see him, he's clothed and sitting, sitting beside Jesus in his right mind. Where did he get the clothes? Doesn't specifically say, but he's with Jesus. You visited me when I was in prison. You came unto me. You shall, and then the, then the righteous shall answer, when do we do this? But he says, if you, verse 40, if you've done this unto me, you've done it unto the least ones, you've done it unto me. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, in other words, speaking to the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice that heaven's prepared for us, the hell is not. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. So if we choose to separate ourselves from Jesus Christ, which is our choice, if we choose to separate ourselves from him, then that means we're going to somewhere that's prepared for devil and his angels. So really, that means we're not supposed to be there, but we're choosing to be there. <laughs> Especially in these days, many Americans, they get upset. People cross the border illegally, which is not right. It's illegal. But many people get upset at that, but yet, Nobody says a word when people die and go to hell and they're, they're there illegally. When they're there, that when heaven was actually prepared for them to, to make place for them, to make room for them, and they separate themselves from Jesus and go illegally out of God's will and plans and purposes that he has for them in their life, they go illegally to hell. It's all by choice. Verse 42, For I was a hungered and you gave me no meat. So in other words, they were selfish. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Selfishness. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Selfish. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Selfish. 
And they shall also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? The word minister means to serve. When did we not serve you? That's something to think about. They're going to be, because even with this, there will be some people that go to church. They're going to have to look at Jesus and say, when did we not serve you? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. But with this, there. It's like, when did we not serve you? When did we not minister to you? When, we didn't, when did we not take care of you? Probably when you didn't answer his voice. When you didn't hear what he was telling you to do. When you chose to do your own thing. Because when you separate yourself from somebody, it's hard to serve them. It's hard to serve somebody when you're not there. It's hard to be with somebody when you choose to separate. Verse 45, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. So goats are not doers of the word and lifestyle. They don't care about serving God. All they care about is what's in it for them. That's a separation. Because again, that even takes us back to the verse we've quoted about four times tonight. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you're not a doer of the word then that makes you a goat. And you're not profitable for the kingdom of God. So you're, you're essentially, not, not just because you're not a doer, but because you don't love Jesus, you're separating yourself from Him. So Jesus is the great separator, even though it's our choice. When we're all, con- when we're all confronted with conviction, not condemnation, when we're all confronted with conviction, we have a choice. And in that moment in time, you're going to find out where you're really submitted. Either you're submitted to Jesus, all right, Lord, I know I need to fix that. Or you're submitted to yourself. Man, that's mean. Why is the pastor picking on me? Why is that? Why is he got to read that verse? Why is this? Why is that? Now you're left with a choice. One is making sure that they're not separating themselves from God to say, all right, God, I see that I need to fix it because they want to follow him. The other says, I don't care nothing about that. That's mean. That's picking on me. That's whatever. Because you've separated your heart from Jesus. And knowing the word can fix you and to help you. Because even the Pauline epistles tells us the word, all scripture is profitable for rebuke, for correction. For everything we have need of, all scripture is beneficial. It's profitable for that. But if you separate yourself From the Word, remember Jesus is the Word made flesh. If you separate yourself, then offense comes. Because great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you love Jesus, when you love the Word, when you love God, nothing will offend you because you want to follow after your shepherd. Not, Not just your pastor, because I can't get you into heaven, but the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, following Him, loving Him, Knowing Him as your Savior, but also your Lord and Master gets you into heaven. Verse 46, last verse. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal, into life eternal. So we can see that there's also this great separation. And it's not handed out as punishment from Jesus Christ. All he does is separate what's already there. He just he separates what's coming to him. <laughs> That's like when you when people just separate certain things, you 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 don't determine what the things are, you just separate them for what they for what they are. In other words, we could say if you have a a I want to make this up, a gidget and a gizmo. If they're coming down the factory line, you don't just say, all right, that's a Gidget, that's a Gizmo. I'm calling them that because they don't have names, so I'm going to separate them because I like this one, I don't like that one. All you do is you just separate them based on what they already are. 
So we've got to determine that we're going to be a sheep, that we're going to be wheat, that we're going to be everything that God wants us to be and to not separate ourselves from Jesus Christ, that he has no reason to separate us from him, that he has no reason to put us at his left hand. He has no reason to throw us up and we fly off with any wind of doctrine, but that we follow through with everything that God has for us and we follow Jesus all the days of our life, either till we meet him in the air or that we take our last breath and we stand before him. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that we make the right choices, not just tonight, but for all of the rest of our life. Because these are the last days and things are not going to get brighter in a sense. They're going to get darker. So we've got to make sure that we do everything in our power, everything that we can to know the Word, to know our Savior, to latch on to Him, endure to the end, and be saved. I don't want to, don't want it to come across as in hopeless and well, just hang on. We're going to barely get by. No, no, no. There's power. There's power in being in the, in the fold of Jesus Christ, being in the flock of God. There's power and authority that we have. That we're more than conquerors. That there's so much promised to us. There's so much victory given to us. So we've got to make sure that even in that, that we stay on the right side of Jesus Christ. That we choose to have that victory. We choose to overcome the things of the enemy. We choose to not allow him to have influence in our ear, to have favor in our life. That we block him out. That we submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. No matter how you shape this out, no matter how you shake it out either, the word, the word can bring us so full circle into the things of God if we'll only submit to it, if we'll only know it and apply it to our heart and our life, which will cause us to fall more in love with Jesus. The more that we know the word, the more that we pray to God, it'll help us to fall more in love with Jesus Christ and it'll have let, the devil will have less room in our life to separate us. Because remember, the word tells us not to give him a foothold, not to give him any ounce of our life. So may we be determined to say, Jesus, I'm going wherever you go, and nothing and nobody is going to separate me from you. Not only say it, but do it. Amen. Amen.